Hello, everyone. My name is Sajin, as Celia said. Um, I would please join me in welcoming our speaker for today, Dr. Karin Pageman. Dr. Pageman is a disease ecologist and an assistant professor at Arizona State University with a strong interest in how the biology and ecology of parasites, viruses, and insect vectors shape the distribution and intensity of infectious diseases. His translation research aims to better inform disease control and prevention programs with the ultimate aim to reduce, reduce disease morbidity and mortality. Together with his team, Dr. Pageman studies the biology and behavior of disease vectors to design new tools and strategies for mosquito surveillance and control. He is also the head of the entomology platform at the Menisa Health Research Center in Southern Mozambique as the member of the Mozambican Alliance towards the elimination of malaria he coordinates the malaria elimination entomological monitoring and participates in evaluating tools and strategies to interrupt transmission of Plasmodium falciparum and eliminate its reservoir. Thank you for being here to share your research with us, Dr. Pageman. All right, and thank you very much, everyone, for the invitation from PACFEC. I'm happy to be here and to present my work. Hopefully, you can uh, see my presentation and hear me OK. Um, I was planning to do this from home, but they disconnected us from the internet this morning. So, that, so that's why I had to hurry into work. And that's why I'm now here at work behind my desk, trying to do this on a laptop. So I'm trying to see Zoom and chat and everything now on a very tiny screen, but I will do my best. If, if anything is um, not okay, then please, please let me know. All right, here we go. So in today's talk, I will walk you through um, many of the studies that we have been doing and are doing in Mozambique. Um, because since, I think, 2012, I've been very active um, uh, work, well, very actively working in, in Africa. Um, and slowly, although I arrived here at ASU, Arizona State University, I think three years ago, we slowly starting to, um, to do some entomological studies here um, on campus and together with Maricopa County Vector Control elsewhere here in the, in the, in the greater Phoenix metropolitan area. Um, unfortunately, for many of you, there's only a few slides uh, on the final bit, I think six or seven, seven slides. So the majority of my talk today is actually about um, uh, my work um, and that of my colleagues in uh, Mozambique. So I'm going to walk you today to some of the entomological surveillance that we do in Mozambique. Nowadays, people love to call it entomological intelligence because it sounds, I think, very fancy. Um, just I will walk you through some of the monitoring evaluation activities that we do. Um, just to see how vector control products actually actually perform in the field. Um, I will walk you through one, maybe two, so I'll keep an eye on the time because I, 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 I can always talk forever um, about the things that we are doing. So, you know, for the sake of time, I may skip one, uh, but if not, I'd like to walk you through two of the operational research studies we have been doing just to look at the gaps in protection that bed nets provide and also indoor residual spraying. Um, where we spray walls in homes with insecticides to kill mosquitoes. Um, and I have a few slides on the critical assessment of uh, vector control policies, guidelines, and implementations. Um, and that's basically, I call it lessons learned after working for more than seven years now in, uh, in Mozambique and being involved in malaria control and uh, elimination efforts. All right, so just to, just to, so. I probably I don't have to explain it to you, to this audience, but why we do entomological surveillance in the first place in Mozambique because just to get ecological and entomological data on, uh, on, uh, on mosquito, vector biology, ecology and behavior. And then we go back to the Ministry of Health, National Mail Control Programs. Um, we present the data and we try to help them with um, their policy recommendations, right? What, what can they do um, if they want to target these mosquito populations? So in Africa, uh, when we talk about malaria vectors, um, oftentimes we make decisions about bed nets, right, the long-lasting insecticidal nets, and also about indoor residual spraying, as I mentioned before, the spraying of walls inside homes with insecticides. Um, decisions are made, implementers come in, um, they uh, distribute bed nets or they spray homes. That's where we as entomologists come in again. Uh, because then we have to evaluate these mosquito control products, right? So we go back to mosquito surveillance and we can see like, okay, did, is anything changing? Is the species composition changing? Are densities changing? Is, is their behavior uh, changing? Um, and based on that, we can come up with um, recommendations for optimizing the current tools or maybe think about alternative or uh, supplementary 
uh, vector control tools. So that's in a nutshell, right? Walking you through uh, some of the, the things, basically everything, the rationale for wh why we do all the studies that I will uh, show you now in the next 40 minutes, um, all the studies we do in Mozambique. So just to start with part one, you know, from Mozambique and malaria, before we go to Maricopa and arboviruses, um, just to give you a highlight of what we have in Mozambique. So I work in uh, sort of Mozambique uh, a lot in the Manisa Health Research Center. It's an hour's drive from uh, the capital, Maputo City. And over the past five, six years, we have built um, an entomological facility there with three climate controlled insectaries. We have an entomological laboratory for mosquito identification for um, WHO and CDC insecticide resistance assays. And since a few years, we also have experimental huts um, in sort of Mozambique where we can um, test new vector control products. Um, and as I put a sign up, right, these are for rent. So if you want to do studies in Africa using experimental hut, right, of, you know, looking at mosquito behaviors, testing products, um, or just study behavior in general, just reach out to me and we may be able to work something out. Good, so then this particular part, I will walk you through mosquito surveillance. So what are some of the, the traps and tools that we are using, some of the strategies. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, monitoring and evaluation. I will only show how we monitor uh, the residual efficacy of uh, indoor residual uh, spray um, products. And then, as I mentioned, um, a few studies on operational research, just thinking about we give all these nets and we spray all these houses, but you know, are we, are we doing the right thing? Can we optimize, optimize this? You know, that's where the human components come in. We do a lot of social studies as entomologists, which is always fun because I don't think we are particularly good at it. Um, but we develop our own questionnaires and we just try to figure out, do people like this or, you know, are they using it, et cetera, et cetera. So these, hopefully you can see it. So our research institution is here where my cursor is one hour away from Maputo. But nowadays we have expanded our entomological surveillance activities um, across three provinces in, uh, in southern Mozambique. And just for scale, right, look at all these countries here, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Tanzania, and Mozambique is very long. Um, and, and we work now and we help the National Mare Control Program with entomological surveillance in these three southern provinces. The aim was to eliminate malaria in Maputo province by 2020, you know, it's 2021. I know, didn't work, I'll get back to that later. Um, and also to help them with get to pre-elimination in Gaza and Yambana province. So what are some of the tools that the National Mare Control Program is implementing? Well, long lasting insecticidal nets here on the left. Um, every three years, they've got a mass distribution campaign where um, there is one net distributed for every two persons in a household. Um, I think I think the whole pandemic um, messed things up quite a bit. So I think they are running a year behind now with distribution. But you know that is in the foreseeable future. Every once every three years they will roll out um, these bed nets through their mass distribution campaigns. Um, more and more districts are actually being sprayed with insecticides inside homes. We call that in in uh, indoor residual spraying or IRS. Um, and of course, a first-line treatment to malaria is always drugs. And I've worked in one um, district in southern Mozambique where they piloted mass drug administration. So for two years in a row, um, they had two rounds every year during the rainy season of uh, mass drug administration. Good. So this, these are some of the questions that we get um, um, from the program, from the National Malaria Control Program in Mozambique. So this is the logo. Um, so their question is, could indoor residual spraying be effective in currently untargeted areas in southern Mozambique, right? So everyone here has a bed net, one net for every two persons. What happens, you know, can we also do indoor residual spraying on top of that just to, you know, accelerate, as we say it, to, uh, to zero malaria, to zero local malaria transmission? Um, so that depends on a few questions. And, and two of the key questions that um, are often asked in the country is do malaria vectors rest indoors? Um, because those are the ones that will be affected by these insecticides that we spray on the walls. And of course, are they susceptible to the insecticides that we use? So those are two of the tests, uh, things that we test. Um, how the country, and, and I think that's very important to stress, how the country normally does it is they do peer term spray catches. And I have a picture here on, on the bottom um, of the slide. So basically they come in 
6, 7, 8, 9 a.m. in the morning. Uh, we put white sheets on the floor. Uh, we spray uh, a commercially available insecticide um, right, that normal household members can also use off the shelf um, sprays like Bagon or Doom. Um, and all the mosquitoes that are still in the house resting on the wall and they have not flown away, right, because we are roaming around there as well. And uh, we'll fold that on top of this white sheet. And then we take these sheets outside uh, and we look for the Anopheles mosquitoes and uh, the ones that transmit malaria. Um, and that is, you know, to, trying to answer, do vectors rest inside? And this is the only method actually that uh, in many of the Sentinel sites in Mozambique, the National Air Control Program is using. So our aim, of course, is also to show that, you know, if you only use this tool, you're only getting a snapshot. Um, of your vector species composition and densities because the only thing you do is early morning you go inside a home and you spray so you don't know what's happening outdoors you also don't know what has happened during the night uh, maybe mosquitoes came in to bite but did not rest uh, maybe mosquitoes came in to bite but did rest but they are early leavers um, as we call them right so they leave the house before sunrise before you come in so that's why we started implementing some other tools um, as well. And we use a, a human beta tent trap picture here, human beta tent trap outside and inside. Basically, it's a camping tent. Um, we cannot do human landing catches in southern Mozambique because there's a arbo, arbo virus transmission going on. So we have to look for alternatives. For those of you that are not familiar with human landing catches, that's basically where volunteers are sitting outside with their legs exposed the whole night to uh, mosquitoes and they aspirate mosquitoes off their, off their legs. Um, we've never done that. Um, and, and recently, there's more and more evidence now in Mozambique that uh, arboviruses such as dengue are circulating. Um, so I'm happy that we never did it. So we come up with an alternative. We have someone sleeping in a camping tent protected by the inner tent, and we just put a CDC light trap between the inner and outer tent. So mosquitoes can fly in from all sides, cannot bite the person, um, but they fly in the tent and are sucked in by a CDC light trap. And we also have window exit traps here, picture on the bottom right that is trying to capture the house leaving behaviors of mosquitoes during the night. Um, and if we have lots of blood fed, just recently blood fed mosquitoes in there, it's a good indication that they are feeding inside, but then try to leave to rest elsewhere and not necessarily indoors uh, on the walls that are sprayed. Good, and the reason why we do it is if you, if you look at this particular environment, right? Traditional African house, this is the environment where people live. Um, currently, if you only do periodic spray catches, um, which, which the program is doing in, in many of the Sentinel sites, you may think like, yes, there is some Anopheles finestis here and it's a vector resting inside the wall. So let's do IRS because it will kill those resting mosquitoes. But maybe your transmission is happening elsewhere. Maybe the bulk of your transmission, so 85% could happen outside um, by vectors you will never ever see in your pair to spray catch. So that's why we started having these additional tools um, to what the National Air Control Program is using just to see if there's like other things happening in the environment and things that we should be aware of. So here are then some of the data. So I, I, let me walk you through this. So this is from a particular area, um, a district, Chokwe district in Gaza province. It's very close to um, rice fields. Um, so irrigated rice fields. Um, we have been sampling in the dry season here, indicated with the sun and in a rainy season. And uh, we, we do both because often IRS starts at the end of the dry season. So uh, often for logistic reasons. So first of all, they want to hit a mosquito population bottleneck, but also they want to have completed the, the largest uh, proportion of the houses with spraying before the rainy season really starts because it becomes logistically very challenging to get to places during the rainy season. Um, so, and then here we have our tools like the tent trap inside for indoor biting, the tent trap outside for outdoor biting. Um, indoor resting, so this is the conventional method uh, from the National Mayor Control Program, the period from spray catch, right? Coming in early morning, spraying the house and collecting what's falling on the white sheets. And these are the data from our exit traps, the window traps. And just to, just to highlight a few things, so these are the data that the um, Ministry of Health would be collecting. So um, during the dry season, they would say, well, we, we did uh, Petrus spray catch. There's a, there's a little bit here of Anopheles imani, but look, we have um, Anopheles finestis and we know it's, it's highly anthropophilic and it likes to be inside. Um, so, you know, based on these data, you would say, well, maybe iris spraying wells will have an impact uh, on malaria transmission. 
But then with our tools, right, looking at what is biting indoor here, there's several vectors that are biting indoors, such as Anopheles tenebrosos, and it's been incriminated as a vector now in Mozambique, um, that you don't really, you know, you don't really see that signature in many of the Sentinel sites where we work in, um, in, uh, in the Peritone spray catch, so they're not really resting on the walls, but we see them biting inside. And moreover, there's a lot of biting happening outdoor, including uh, this particular species, which is um, Anopheles ar arabiensis from the Anopheles gambi complex, um, also one of the main vectors in the area. Right, so so we we by giving this picture, we hope that we can start a dialogue by saying like, should we do peritum? Uh, sorry, should we do indoor residual spraying, or maybe should we look for alternatives? Maybe um, larval source management um, at the end of the dry season. Um, so maybe if we target breeding sites, we can actually knock all these mosquito species uh, on their head. Then going to the rainy season, not a lot of activity inside in. Uh, in um, when, when we do peer to spray catches in Chokwe. Um, but just to have your, your focus here on the left and right, lots of mosquito species are biting indoors during the night. Um, and there's a few of those that bite indoor and also are leaving the house during the night, blood fed, so recently blood fed, which is an indication that they are not resting on the wall. We don't know for sure that last bit, but the fact that they are not like semi-gravid or gravid you know, means that they have not been resting for uh, one or two or three days on the wall um, before they fly outside to look for uh, um, for a breeding site. So that's that's just some of the entomological surveillance that we do, um, just to help the country make decisions on uh, indoor residual spraying or maybe other supplementary tools. Uh, a key question, of course, is which insecticides to use. Um, so we do a lot of um, WHO tube test or CC bottle assays in Southern Mozambique. We test all um, these um, chemical classes that can be used in our own bed nets, such as pyrotroids. Um, and we have a few more classes available uh, when it comes to indoor residual spraying. So we test those. I, one of the few things I like to show is that we live in an air, uh, well, we work in an area where there's like high resistance to, um, to pyrotroids. So these, these are some of the pyrotroids, the active ingredients that we've been testing, right? We have the untreated control, you know, almost no mosquitoes are dying, which is great um, because it's a control and there's no insecticide there. But on the insecticide treated papers, because these are WHO tube assays, um, we actually hope to see, of course, 100% mortality, um, which means that they are susceptible. Uh, but to all these uh, pyrotroids um, active ingredients, um, we have a very hard time killing the mosquitoes. Um, so they're like super resistant, um, which, which has several consequences. And I will only highlight one. Um, we've been doing some, uh, some, some bed net tests. Um, and it turns out to kill half of our local mosquito populations, uh, we need to have these mosquitoes for at least six hours nonstop on top of a bed net. And we don't think um, that that is very realistic because there's studies out there that have looked at uh, mosquito behavior in relation to bed nets. And often contact time with a bed net is in the order of minutes, not the hours. Um, so it's highly likely that um, these bed nets um, that we are using in our areas in Southern Mozambique are not killing our uh, um, super resistant Anopheles uh, Finestis mosquitoes. I will not go into um, the genetic details. We have a we have a, a resistant marker, and it seems that that particular um, allele is completely fixed now in, in the population. But what is very worrying is that we have been working with the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. They've been evaluating our mosquitoes, um, our um, resistant Anopheles finestis, um, and they found um, they've been putting these. Um, resistant Anopheles finestis mosquito on different types of bed nets here on the left right so these are our mosquitoes so here we have mortality rates on the on the y-axis our mosquitoes from Mozambique versus a susceptible Kisumu strain that they have um, and all these types of bed nets the susceptible strain um, those mosquitoes are killed um, but none of our resistant um, finestis mosquitoes are killed and why is this worrying uh, because there's two nets in there um, that uh, we call them the next generation of bed nets that have the synergist PBO. And we were really hoping um, that um, by using these synergist nets, um, 
that we would increase um, the proportion of musculars that actually would be dying when they would be landing on the net. So we, we, you know, when we do laboratory assays, we can see that PBO as a synergy is really helping. So we can kill, um, not fully 100%, so we cannot really restore uh, susceptibility, um, but we are able in those WHO tube tests to see that we can increase mortality again in our resistant um, um, uh, mosquitoes. However, when these mosquitoes are really put on the next generation of bed nets, uh, we didn't see that effect, which is very worrying. Great, so now I'm, I'm moving on to um, some of the monitoring and evaluation activities that we are doing um, um, for the country. So I'm only gonna show, we, we've done bed net studies, so we collect bed nets and we look at bed net integrity and we look at bioficacy of, of bed nets over time um, after the distribution, which, which is something that is, is really critical uh, because bed nets are provided. And then, as I mentioned before, these, um, mass distribution campaigns are only happening once every um, three years. So then the question is, if you give people a bed net, right, um, where do these nets go over time? If they're still being used, you know, how often are they being used? Are they used every night? Um, do they have holes? If they have holes, which, which, um, which sizes of holes are present in the net? Um, because the WHO has these guidelines that we, we can use to say like, well, you know, an X percent of the nets is actually unacceptable. So we need to go back and do, for example, a top-up uh, campaign just to make sure that we, you know, we maintain this universal uh, coverage over time. Um, so I will not be showing this. I will show you some of the, the essays that we do just to look at the residual efficacy of the insecticides that are sprayed on, on the wall. Um, and, and we basically investigate this to, to try to figure out the best timing of spraying uh, because we know from, from many previous products that are sprayed on the wall that um, residual efficacy ranges anywhere between four and eight, nine months. Um, so if you, if you start too early in the dry season, um, maybe by the time that your malaria starts to peak and you've got all these indoor re uh, resting mosquitoes that are transmitting malaria, maybe by that time your residual efficacy has already waned off, right? So your um, insecticides that are on the wall are not effective anymore in killing mosquitoes. Um, or maybe, maybe if you start early, you can, but then you have to do a second round uh, during the transmission season. So that's why we do these sort of essays. We, we are sitting on a lot of data uh, from, for different years, different products, uh, but I will only show you the data for Actelic of the 2016-17 season that we monitored. And, uh, and for those of you who want to know, the active ingredient of Actelic is uh, um, a primophosmethyl um, and organophosphate. So this is what we, you know, some of our activities. So the National Air Control Program and partners come in, um, they spray um, the huts um, and we come in every month with our WHO World Health Organization cone test. And uh, we, we attach those cones to the wall and we have like 10 to 15 uh, susceptible mosquitoes in there. And we have three to four cones uh, per wall, uh, per house. Um, and then these are there for 30 minutes. And after that, we bring them back to the laboratory. Um, they have access to sugar water. And then we look at 24 hour mortality. And we do that for two wall surfaces that are very common in Mozambique. So we have like mud plastered walls uh, and also like uh, concrete unpainted walls uh, that we do these tests in. And, and we do several additional things that are not in the current guidelines. So we look at delayed mortality for the simple fact that um, the guidelines state that we have to look at 24 hour mortality, but if our mosquitoes die um, 48 or 72 hours after exposure to an insecticide treated wall, we think it's still very relevant. Um, simply because, you know, Anopheles malaria mosquitoes are not like Aedes, right? they're not like uh, mosquitoes that typically bite you every day, um, even, even if they had a blood uh, meal yesterday. No, they tend to take a blood meal and then really wait uh, to complete their gonotrophic cycle while resting somewhere in the environment, not biting again. And then they go to oviposit and then they come back for a, for a meal. So looking at the, this delayed mortality, we think that is very critical. And what we also do is we actually continue monitoring uh, when mosquito mortality goes below 80%, because that is the cutoff that uh, is... Uh, um, determined by the WHO, so that's in the guidelines. So the country itself is monitoring the residual effic uh, efficacy of insecticides for five, six months. As soon as your mosquito mortality drops below 80%, they stop. 
right? And and again, the rationale, you know, our thinking is like, you know, it's 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 still, you know, even even if it goes to seventy five or seventy percent, it's still killing a lot of mosquitoes. Um, it's not that at eighty percent, you know, the next month it's zero. No, there's a gradual um, decay, often in a sort of S shape curve. So that's why we decide to continue monitoring. So how do these data look? So we have mosquito mortality on the y-axis here um, across months after IRS. So the 2016-17 the season, we monitored um, Actelic for a year. Um, in green, we have our control houses uh, and, the, and then the control mortality. And here in red, we have the mortality on the treated wall surfaces. So the wall surfaces that have Actelic. On the left, concrete walls. And on the right, we have um, mud plastered walls. So as you can see, this is a sort of um, data that we get year in, year out, right? Where initially there's good protection for three, four months. And then, you know, your um, mosquito mortality of your susceptible mosquito starts to uh, go below 90 and then slowly it goes up to 80 and then it goes um, below 80. Interestingly, in a different color. So the, the black line is um, according to guidelines, we monitor 24 hour mortality after a half hour exposure to the walls. But if you look at the mortality like um, 48 hours, right after that half hour exposure on the wall or 72 hours, you can see that you start getting, you know, um, a sort of additional protection, right? These, these mosquitoes, right? These lines are higher than the black line. So you get this um, additional benefit if you look at um, um, delayed mortality. Just to um, put in some lines, right? So if you look at the red circles, um, that is the first month in which your mortality is, is uh, dropping below the 80% threshold as set forward by WHO, right? So this is, this is normally when countries stop to monitor. Um, but then this is what I mean, right? If you look at the shape of the line, right? The next month, you can still have 63% uh, protection, right? Here even, um, you know, because it's, it's research, it can happen. Even here the next month, it's slightly higher again. There's not a, a statistical difference, right? But it's still like around 50, um, 60 percent protection, which are good numbers, right? So, um, and especially we work a lot with modelers in Imperial. They are very interested in those sort of data because it's still killing part of your mosquito population. So, you know, it's not a sudden drop off. You have this gradual decrease in um, in uh, in, in uh, you know, your reduction of mortality. But also if you look at these lines, right? If you look at delayed mortality, um, so, you know, two days or three days after exposure, um, you see that this uh, month in which mortality goes below 80% is actually nine months here. And it's like nine months here on, uh, on mud walls as well. So you get, if you look at the blue line, you get an additional three month protection. Um, so those are some of the messages that we have, right? Um, and we are trying to use these data to say like, should we do a second round of spraying? Should we maybe start later in the dry season and with our IRS campaign? And so those are some of the questions that we try to answer. So then I'm moving on to operational research. Let me have a quick look at the time, how we are doing. All right. Um, I see I have another 15 minutes left because I like to have some questions for, um, um, well, I like to have a 15 minutes, of course, uh, for questions. So, um, so I may only focus on uh, on the first topic here, um, but we do a lot of operational research because we, as entomologists, are in the field a lot. Uh, I always say, like like my colleagues who are medical doctors and look at malaria cases, right? They can get malaria cases on their computer because it's sent by the Ministry of Health or from the hospital. Um, they can go to hospitals, often go back to um, uh, slides. Um, with uh, with bloods and they can still do all sorts of analysis. We as entomologists are not that lucky. There's no uh, biobank with mosquitoes. So we often go to these areas where we have no idea uh, what has happened in the past. Um, and we need to be in the field every day to collect these mosquitoes ourselves. Uh, we cannot just go to a hospital uh, to collect that information. And by being in the field um, every day, you work a lot with these local communities and, and you just, you you see that they are not using the net, not interested in the net. Um, and when it comes to in the indoor residual spray, spraying, you see lots of houses that have hundreds of mosquitoes and you think like, hey, that's very strange because your house was sprayed. 
um, last month. And you start talking uh, to the communities and they say like, well, you know, I don't like this net, it's too hot. Um, or I don't like indoor residual spraying because I'm afraid for my children. So as soon as the teams moved away, I washed my walls. Um, so those are sort of some of the things that we learned in the field and we started um, designing some experiments for that. Um, I will not go into, into detail on the indoor residual spraying. Um, I can, if you're interested, you, you can always send me an email and I can share that part of the slides with you or, um, or, or uh, share some of the papers that we have written on that um, of email. Uh, but I will focus now on long lasting insecticidal nets. So as I highlighted before, right, we were supposed to have eliminated malaria in uh, Maputo province by 2020. We did not achieve the goal. So we are looking very hard you know, as entomologists at our vector control products, um, bed nets, in the residual spraying by saying like, you know, what went wrong? Is it, you know, did we target the right mosquito species? But more and more, we also realize it's like, you know, we need to understand more of, of the human behaviors. Um, and those are often not in, um, included in these um, malaria control and elimination programs. So I want to walk you to this particular figure that we started thinking about at one point. Uh, you know, we decided just to, for fun, we decided to go out there for a night, bring some tents um, and, and sleep in the field, um, um, just in, in, in one of these very remote, like two hour drive uh, communities in the middle of nowhere. Just to just to you know talk um, to community members and just observe what is happening, and what we notice there is that people actually spend time outside because they are cooking and doing the homework. But as soon as it got dark, they moved inside. Um, they lit candles, but they were still inside, not yet, of course, uh, in bed. And then at one stage, they went to bed, where they may decide to use or not use uh, a bed net. So we started looking at all these comp compartments, as we call them. So let me highlight them here in this slide, right? So while we were there, you know, from sunset uh, to sunrise, we noticed that, you know, people can either be outside um, doing activities um, where they're exposed to mosquito bites. They can be inside, but not yet in bed, um, where they can be exposed to mosquito bites. And then they can be in bed, and they may or may not use a bed net and be exposed to uh, mosquito bites. Um, and then they can be inside the house again, but not in bed anymore during the morning when they get up, right, just to get dressed or maybe do cooking and where they can be exposed to mosquito bites. And then eventually they go to compartment five and where they go outdoors again, and maybe they are exposed to early biting uh, mosquitoes. So we wanted to look at all these compartments. Um, so we designed a cross-sectional human behavior study um, and, and we did it in parallel with, um, with uh, mosquito collections. So how, do, how you know, looking at the cross-sectional human behavior evaluations, we, we went um, to hundreds of households uh, within the time span of um, a month or two. We did that in the dry season and in the rainy season, um, just because we felt that behaviors may change, right? Day length is definitely changing. Um, and, and behaviors may change because of rainfall or be, uh, because of the fact that there's maybe more malaria, more mosquitoes during the rainy season. Um, and basically we had a questionnaire that we, um, we, we asked them lots of questions, filled out a questionnaire with them. Uh, but we also, what we also did is we gave them watches, digital watches and a little scorecard here where we just asked them, when do you go inside your house? Not to come out um, anymore. When do you actually go to bed, right? Not necessarily for, uh, for sleeping. Um, and when do you leave the bed again during the morning? Um, and then after leaving the bed, when do you leave the house again? Um, so those were some of the, you know, just to get a feeling of how long they spent inside each of these indoor compartments. Um, mosquito collections were done with CDC light traps, both inside and outside the houses. And we used these um, collection bottle rotators that we started using here in uh, Maricopa County now as well. Um, and we placed them inside and outside of homes um, and programmed them to collect mosquitoes in two hour intervals from uh, sunset to uh, sunrise. So now we'll try to walk you to these figures. So these are um, manuscripts that are all in, in preparation. We just finished this analysis, I think two weeks ago. Um, so here on the left-hand side, um, we have the low transmission season here on the right-hand side. And uh, we have the high transmission season. And in gray is for each participant, um, 
here they are in the outdoor compartment and slowly here in orange, they start to move inside their home, right? So that's the orange bit, compartment two. So they're going inside their homes, but they're not yet going to bed, um, which is what this particular line is indicating, right? So here, it's roughly an hour, on average an hour, people spend inside their house, but are not yet going to bed. And gradually, um, people start going to bed and that, that's this particular area here where in red is those that are in bed but not using a bed net and in green are those in bed and actually using a bed net. And then here in the morning people start to leave um, their bed but they're still inside the house so that's the orange area before they go outside the house again and then you're in your gray area right so those are the five compartments that are here on the bottom uh, left as well. So we know their behavior for hundreds, hundreds of people. We, we, have, we know differences between uh, age groups, between the sexes, but this is all like uh, summarized uh, for the two seasons. So we know when participants uh, move inside their homes, when they actually go to bed, when they get out of bed, and when they leave their house again. And we try to match that with, um, with mosquito behaviors. Um, so these are some of the data that we have from our uh, collection bottle rotator and CDC light traps for the low transmission season on the left and the high transmission season. Um, for indoor biting mosquitoes, which are in red and outdoor biting mosquitoes. And these are five species, Arabiensis, Miras, Finestis, Parensis, Quamosis, that we have at least once found positive for, uh, for malaria in the area, right? If you look at the numbers, they're not brilliant. Um, we are very confident when we talk about Anopheles uh, arabiensis because we've got hundreds of, uh, of this particular vector. Of the others, not so much, and especially not during some of the seasons because they were, were not present, right? But what we just want to highlight is just that they have these different uh, peaks in biting time. So we have some early biters, some, some mosquitoes here, especially outdoors like arabiensis that seem to bite more around midnight, right? Or before midnight. Um, and then here um, we have some mosquitoes that tend to bite after midnight, for example. So, and then we try to match that and we have used, uh, um, we have, well, we've updated an existing uh, uh, model for that that was published last year by uh, Monroe and colleagues. Um, so, and basically what we get, if we match these um, behaviors, right? So we look at these compartments, we can see where people are and we can see where our mosquitoes are biting. Um, you can see that 12.5% of the bites is actually happening in this particular gray area here in the beginning, right? When people are outside before they go, uh, before they retreat indoors. 22% um, of the bite is happening in this orange area where people uh, have moved indoors, but they're still not in bed. 64% uh, of the bite happened actually when uh, people were in bed, not using or using a bed net. Um, and only a very small proportion of the bites was actually happening here in this orange area on the right and gray area where people are outside the bed, but still indoors or when they moved um, um, to the outdoor environment again. So that is our result slide. So what we are trying to say is that these, these outdoor biting mosquitoes or, or, or indoor biting mosquitoes before people go to bed are actually um, very important, um, uh, probably I have to say in, in malaria transmission. And that in combination with this poor use of bed nets, because lots of people were still getting bites simply because they, um, they were not using the bed net. However, what we cannot do, and this was done in an area where they were trying to achieve malaria elimination by bed nets, indoor residual spraying, and also mass drug administration. Um, we cannot use traditional metrics such as entomological inoculation rate because we do not know um, the sporozoite rates um, in these vectors. Um, because there was several rounds of mass drug administration, we, we screened hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of mosquitoes um, every season um, and only found a handful of mosquitoes that actually had uh, falciparum malaria. So we cannot conclude anything about uh, residual malaria transmission. Also, you know, we know that Funestis, even though you can collect fewer numbers of Funestis, it tends to be a better vector. So you can maybe collect way more um, Anopheles arabiensis, but still your Anopheles funestis could be your major vector, even if it's in a lower abundance, because it's a very efficient vector. Um, and what we also need to investigate is the feeding inhibition of bed nets, um, because we also did some uh, modeling exercises to see what would have happened if everyone 
uh, use the bednet every night. And then still we cannot prevent some of the bites simply because bed nets are not fully protecting you from, uh, from, uh, from mosquito bites. And we think that is especially the case. Uh, so there's a model parameter for that called feeding inhibition. We used um, experimental HUD trial data for that. Um, but we know, as I said before, that we have super resistant mosquitoes that can just go and land on a bed net and may still be able to bite you because they're not killed by uh, the pyrethroids. So maybe that feeding inhibition in reality is even higher in the areas where we work. So even if you would use a bed net, uh, maybe you still cannot prevent a lot of the malaria transmission simply because our mosquitoes don't care. They will just land on the bed net and, uh, and bite you. Good. And as I mentioned, I will skip this bit. So let me quickly skip this bit because we did a lot of social studies on, uh, on uh, indoor uh, residual spraying as well. Um, I will quickly go over this particular slide because I want to, to share some slides with you of the activities that we do in Maricopa County. Um, I just want you to focus on this is that after seven years of working in, in Africa, I also realized looking at myself that um, at one point I thought like, maybe I'm just working like a headless chicken. You know, what am I doing? Because as entomologists, we, we just have these, you know, we do CDC light traps and 10 houses or 15 or 20 breeding sites. Um, so, as, you know, we start thinking more and more now, it's like, you know, is there is there a better way of doing entomological surveillance, right? So there's this particular bit, um, you know, it, especially in these pre-elimination areas, um, we are not collecting a lot of mosquitoes. Certainly, we're not collecting mosquitoes anymore that have uh, malaria parasites. So can we still inform the National Malaria Control Program, which is the vector? Does it really matter? Um, should we know those data? Does it depend on, uh, on the kind of vector control tool that we will be using? Um, so we start critically evaluating our own program by saying like, what is the question? What, uh, what are the tools that we, uh, that we are using um, to answer that question? And, and you know, what, what are the indicators, right? What are we gonna measure how often and, and where? Um, and also more and more, we started thinking about, um, you know, should we, should we distribute more nets? You know, it, there is now, also in Mozambique, there will be more district with IRS, even IRS on top of NET. Um, there will be new active ingredients that are being developed. They will go to NETs, they will go to IRS because those are like a silver bullet when it comes to uh, factor control. But I started really getting <clears throat> worried and thinking about the term eth ethical uh, entomology a lot because you know, in theory, I'm, I'm there sampling, I'm there to inform the National Control Program. And, and, and I think what we want to achieve is we want to protect um, as much uh, people, well, as much people as possible, right? For every dollar that we spend on vector control, right? So if I spend one dollar on vector control, you know, which package um, is giving me um, the most protection um, for the communities? So not not to go through this. So we we uh, together with uh, my colleague here at ASU, so we have we we have written some reviews and opinions by thinking like. Should we use the, the next generation of insecticides actually on bed net or IRS? Or since we see all these problems in, uh, in malaria elimination with outdoor biting vectors, um, and vectors that bite indoor, but are not resting indoor, but flat, leaving the house again, should we maybe use them in different products like uh, window screens? Or uh, people have been using an outdoor mosquito barriers, right? Just to catch those mosquitoes that fly from houses to breeding sites. Um, so those are some of the things that we are taught, uh, thinking about. Um, and also about you know these these essays that we do WHO tube and CDC um, essays were like you know what what is actually telling the the, the national air control program because maybe you do these tests and you see that an insecticide well, we have resistance uh, but we we refer to that now as technical resistance doesn't mean that your product that has the same active ingredient in the field will not kill your uh, your mosquitoes anymore. So we are thinking more and more like how can we actually do resistance tests with actual products in the fields with local mosquitoes? For example, during uh, the nighttime period when mosquitoes are really active, where well, we think we know that things change, right? When we look at uh, metabolism and everything. So those are some of the things that we are thinking now a lot uh, in Mozambique by how can we really inform uh, vector control programs adequately and, and make sure that we choose the right factor control products. So for the final five minutes, I'd like to jump to uh, some of the activities that we do now here in, in Maricopa. I showed you our facilities in, uh, in Mozambique in the past. 
I would love to show you our facilities that we have here at Arizona State University, but our BSL3 facilities where we can work with exotic mosquitoes and, and, and pathogens is still under construction. And now we think it is it's completed in in September, but it's been it's been a it's been a long wait, because uh, I arrived here early 2018, um, and we are still waiting for this particular facility to be completed. Um, if you're interested, we have a, a YouTube video made by our graduate and undergraduate students for the ASU Open Door for this year because everything was uh, virtual because of the pandemic. So we made a nice video um, about our laboratory in sectory and the students are walking you through so you can see the little space that we are uh, working in now and from which we operate. Good, so just a few slides. Uh, what we do, we started some entological studies here on the ASU Tempe campus. I have one slide on that. Uh, and a few weeks ago, we started monitoring uh, in the Salt River area here in Maricopa County. And we do that together with uh, Maricopa County Vector Control um, and with uh, Dr. Kirk Smith and with, uh, with Jim, Jim Will here also on the picture. And we work a lot with, uh, with uh, Biogens as well. So here we have Andreas Rosa as well. And these are studies done by my local graduate students, uh, Joshua Kamuni and Dave Bas and Joe. So as I said before, only one slide. We don't have data. Um, we, yesterday we collected our first mosquitoes here. You can see it. But what we try to do on the on the Tempe campus is we worked with um, the Arizona State University vector control. They identified four or five areas where there's lots of mosquitoes on campus and where people complain. And we set uh, BG Pro traps there. And what we are doing first now uh, is just find uh, the best CO2 source uh, for us. So we're comparing dry ice with uh, the CO2 cylinder um, and with sugar, water and yeast, regular yeast, yeast um, that we can get off the shelf, off, over the counter. Um, and we're also testing uh, a new yeast, yeast formulation um, that you can buy from, uh, from Biogens. So that is something that we're testing, no data. Uh, we'll probably know more in two or three months time. And if you're interested, I would suggest um, you invite and they bus and job to, to present those data in the near future. Um, we do have a bit more data when it comes to um, um, the project that we started a month ago in the, in the Salt River area. So this is um, in the area where the 202 and the 101 intersect. Um, it's a reservation area. And we put two traps uh, in that particular area that has a lot of mosquito activity over the, the, the many, many, many years um, in the past, even before uh, before I came to Arizona. Um, and these are the same as we use in Mozambique, our rotator traps. So we have rotator traps, and on top of that, an EVS trap, and then uh, we capture them uh, with dry eyes. Um, so are these productive? Yes, I wish we saw these sort of pictures in, <laughs> in Mozambique, to, to be honest with you, because most houses that we collect in Mozambique have zero mosquitoes, and uh, occasionally two, three, or four. Um, and if we are lucky, there's a very productive house that has 30. Well, that's not the case in this particular area when it comes to Culex, mostly Culex tassalis. Um, there's hundreds of them, right, in time intervals of, um, of three hours. Um, so we are collecting uh, just a wealth of data, and we are very happy that um, Jim, Jim Will is helping us with identifying uh, all these mosquitoes. So here are some preliminary data. Um, we, we have been collecting in those areas Culex tassalis here in red, uh, Aedes vexens in yellow, um, and also Culex quinca fasciatus. But it's a known area for Culex uh, tassalis, not too much for qu qu Culex quinca fasciatus. We probably have to go more, more to urban areas. Um, and basically, we see mosquito numbers increase uh, after sunset. Um, and, and there seems to be a peak here just before, uh, before sunrise. Um, so why do we do these sort of studies is because we really like to work to, uh, with Maricopa County Vector Control just to see like um, how does that relate to uh, the time of uh, insecticidal fogging. So when mosquito numbers go above a certain threshold uh, in many areas here in the valley, um, Maricopa County Vector Control will go out there during the night um, and, and fog those areas. And typically they fog from 12 to 5. So we seem to be in the in the right ballpark here, right? I highlighted that area. Lots of mosquito activity here between midnight and six, but there's also mosquito activity here um, before midnight. Um, and what we really like to do next is zoom in and look at every hour when these um, when these peaks occur, because this particular peak may occur just um, before 
um, or after sunrise, which is something that we are not capturing now because we, we collect in three hour intervals. So that brings me to my final slides. Um, and then we have 10 minutes left for questions. Um, so we like to have these sort of data also for uh, other mosquito species. So we're looking for, uh, for other areas to set up our rotator traps. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, we really like to look at a finer time scale as well, just to see, well, between midnight and 6 a.m., you know, is, is that particular peak really around uh, sunrise maybe? Um, so we are, we are going to go back in a few weeks' time and, and set these rotator traps at uh, one hour intervals um, just to get a, get a finer scale. Um, and then finally, I like to in initiate some, uh, some climate study studies. And uh, my grad student, Joshua Kamuni, who's probably also in this call, already started working on uh, looking at the uh, temperature toxicity relationship. Um, of, um, of some of the public health insecticides and Culex tarsalis. Uh, because if you, if you go in and, and, and fog during the night, um, those are also the times, of the, you know, times of the day when your temperatures are much cooler, right? So even here in, in the desert, what can be very hot during the day, temperatures can drop dramatically during the night. So we just want to see is like, what does that do when we do our insecticide tests at uh, different temperatures? So again, he will have uh, lots of beautiful data over the next month or two. So um, stay tuned. And having said that, I like to end my talk by saying if there's, you know, if you want to have uh, copies of the slide or papers or you want to have more information, just reach out to me, send me, uh, send me an email. All right. Thank you very much.